continue our conversation with Muslim scholar Professor Farid Isak on religious tolerance and extremism. You gave us a bit of context into Islam in um, before we went to the break. I want to touch on Muslim extremism. Um, when we were speaking earlier, you mentioned that in South Africa, this is the first time that we've actually seen an attack. We know in West Africa with Boko Haram, East Africa with Al-Shabaab, um, they've got a problem there in terms of extremism. Are we going to see a situation, perhaps it's even premature to be, to be saying this, but it's worth asking, will we see a situation where this trickles down into South Africa? Well, uh, in these things, one should never say never. Mm. Uh, but one tries to base a forecast on your understanding of the community, on your understanding of international politics. Uh, I don't expect uh, an escalation in tensions uh, as a result of the murder uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. Mm. But, um, and I also don't see uh, ISIS thinking of South Africa as a significant entry point or something to do to, uh, as a theater of operations uh, in uh, South Africa. Uh, South African uh, foreign policy, South African treatment of its Muslim minorities is exemplary. Um, the, uh, the Muslim community, the, the Jewish community, religious minorities in South Africa mm -hmm. have it better than what they have it anywhere in the world. And I speak so without any fear of contradiction. So I don't see a rise in that kind of activity. However, there are tendencies inside the Muslim community that simply has to be curtailed. What tendencies? The tendency to, uh, to, to demonize people on the basis of their beliefs that uh, that if you are uh, not a if you're not an adherent of mainstream expressions of Islam uh, then you are um, well people are entitled to protect their own dogma I don't think that sectarianism by itself is a problem people have the right to believe in sex but once you start spouting uh, hate speech at another group and you start calling them they pigs and they dogs and they snakes and so on and by the way these aren't elements that are peculiar to Muslims you find it in other right. in other groups or in political discourse as well but that kind of language has been allowed to continue without much criticism uh, or condemnation from mainstream Muslim clerical organizations. Mm -hmm. Now these clerical organizations have always argued that look, we have denounced these minority groups such as the Shias as not being part of mainstream Islam. But we've always cautioned our people against taking the law into their own hands and against engaging in active persecution. But I don't know, I think that there is a thin line in the language that you use and in the extent of your vehemence so you and then you say but I'm, I'm telling you you know just don't there's a guy sitting in your congregation he is very sectarian which is perfectly entitled to but he's also psychologically slightly unhinged mm. and this language of sectarianism just falls on fertile <clears throat> falls ground. on fertile ground now you can't blame in some ways you can't blame the guy who promoted sectarianism he didn't unhinge that individual or these three four individuals but <clears throat> it falls on fertile and therefore we as religious leaders have a responsibility to understand that Tolerance and religious pluralism is a two-way street. Muslims can't demand religious freedom, respect for people to go their own religious path, on the one hand from Christians and from a non-Muslim state, and then on the other hand go ballistic when one of your own decides to choose a path different from the mainstream. Freedom of religion, all freedoms are two-way streets. It is a <clears throat> accepting what is given to you in your society and being grateful for it. But hey buddy, 
you don't walk into the doors of freedom and then demand that it be closed after you. Hmm. What you are entitled to in a democracy, everybody else is entitled to in a democracy. And it works like hate speech, you know. Um, you can't, for example, go around saying that the only good Jew is a dead Jew. You can't say, you know, uh, all Jews uh, are Christ killers. And then say, and then the next moment, a Jewish person gets killed or stabbed on the street simply because he, she, sorry, because he was wearing a kippah. And then you were saying, but no, I didn't say you must go and kill uh, a Jew now. I only said all Jews are Christ killers. In closing, Professor Isaac, a personal question to you perhaps. Do you support the view uh, so that some hold that uh, Muslim people are being discriminated against or the tolerance is more heightened when you are a Muslim person? Well, I think that the intolerance is much more heightened. I mean, there is a thing called Islamophobia. You should try, well, South Africa is a bit of a different country, but try in Europe wearing this Arab looking gown, try in Europe wearing a head scarf, even in, even in South Africa in some places, life is made absolutely hell for you. Loud as I am, courageous as I am, I don't take nonsense from anybody. I would never walk in Europe with a, an Arabic or, or a, a quote unquote Muslim gown. I walk freely at the University of Johannesburg through the streets of South Africa freely. I wouldn't. So there is a heightened form of Islamophobia, not massive in South Africa. It exists in small parts of some backwater little communities and these things. And I'm not talking about rural. I'm talking about in the towns and so on. Occasionally, there are people objecting to the erection of a mosque and so on. So there is a heightened this things of Islamophobia. And one of the things about the Verulam thing that is tragic is that people, although it is a once-off event, it's a, ter it's a terrorist attack in my mind, it's not the spread of terrorism in South Africa. But one of the regrettable things is that even if it is one event, it adds to the image of Muslims as an intolerant people. And people so easily forget that we have lived with these Muslims for 360, 70 years in South Africa. And these are people who've contributed to this country to the struggle against apartheid, to the foundations and the establishment of democracy, and who continue to contribute. So Muslims should not be, you know, it's, very, you know, it's like you put a black dot on a wall, and then you ask people on, on a white sheet, and you ask people, what do you see? They'll tell you, I see a black dot. No, 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 it's not Verulam. It is a community of seven to 800,000 who lives in South Africa peacefully and contribute like other religious minorities and majorities contribute to uh, our society at right. all levels. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. I think the main takeout, for me at least, is that it doesn't matter uh, what you call your God or which God you call. We are all one and we are all human. Thank you very much for your time this morning. That was Muslim scholar Professor Farid Isaac.